We have a nice intimate room. Feel free to move down if you'd like. Do we have some BM Puppy Cat fans here? Any? Yeah? Excellent. Bravest Warriors fans? Okay. All right, that's exciting. So you're in for a real treat. I love talking to Fred because I learn something new every time. Fred's like, like Willy Wonka of animation or something. You start to hear all these amazing stories. Um, maybe a great place to start. I've heard a story before um, sort of about how you got into animation in the first place, which I think is pretty interesting. That might be a good place to start here. Which one? Which story? Well, I think as it relates to maybe a logo that some people might be familiar with. Oh, okay, got it. All right. By the way, this is Arlen. Hi. This is the moderator. Okay. I have a little something to do with Verve, and if any of you have checked it out, thank you so much. We're really just doing our best to bring amazing content to fans like you. And so Being Puppy Cat and Bravest Warriors are on the Cartoon Hangover Select channel on Verve. Um, so thanks. Don't, don't let him kid you. He runs the whole place. Uh, so I got into animation uh, really simply because my first job in television was at MTV, or actually when it wasn't MTV. And um, my boss, uh, I called my, my boss and I came out of radio. And he had come out of Top 40 radio and I came out of country music uh, radio and strangely enough, jazz radio. And I um, was talking with him about what this music channel was gonna be. And I said, so what are we gonna do like in between the music videos? I know we're gonna have at the time, you know, we didn't know they were called VJs. We we're going to have like people like hosts, and are we going to have jingles like we do in radio? He goes, oh no, jingles are really stupid. He said, what we should really do is like, you know, have an animated logo in between. And I said, okay, great. Uh, what do you mean? Because I didn't really understand anything. He goes, well, look, how about this? Just imagine a cow, and all of a sudden a cleaver comes down and cuts the cow's head off and it falls down on the ground and the veins are coming out and the blood is, you know, like oozing out and all of a sudden the cow opens its mouth and vomits and in the vomit is our logo. <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay, we can do that. You know, that'll be fine. And that was the beginning of my getting into animation of figuring out what the hell he meant and how to like, you know, make a logo to begin with. I didn't know anything really about that. So I called my best friend, who I'd known since I was five, and was a fantastic illustrator, and said, can you make a logo for this thing? So he spent a year coming up with logos that I rejected. And along the way, we changed the name of the place from the music channel to MTV. And eventually, he and his partners came up with the famous M, and. We did something with a cow, but it wasn't like a vomiting cow. That's unfortunate. Yeah, it really, it really was. <laughs> um, can, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how things progressed from there in terms of going from working on logos to maybe being a little more involved in the animation world. Um, so I, I had a partner, a guy called Alan Goodman, and we did all of these animated logos for MTV and uh, you know, probably a couple hundred of them, you know, over the first few years. Uh, they turned out to really be a phenomenon, and MTV itself turned out to be a phenomenon. But as, as proud as we were of our work, we kind of knew that we were riding on the coattails of this uh, rocket ship, and we really hated being corporate employees. And one day I was in a meeting and one of the big guys, like, you know, one of the like executive vice presidents of the company or something started yelling at one of my colleagues and really humiliating the guy like horribly. And I, we were all like sort of cringing while this guy ripped, you know, another asshole in this poor marketing manager. And I left the room and I walked into Alan's office and I said, look, I, I'm out of here. I can never sit in a meeting like that again. I can never watch something like that happening. And he said, really, like now? And I said, well, no, we don't, I don't know how to make a living now, but like soon I'm quitting. So over the course of a year, I started like trying to figure out what would happen. And I eventually asked Alan to come along and we started a company. Um, we quit. The next day, MTV calls us back and said, hey, how, how about if we hire you as consultants? And one of the reasons we quit is we weren't making enough money, and they offered us a, 
a consulting job for like a third of the money we were making. So something was wrong with this equation, but you know, whatever, we needed a gig and we needed a client. They were willing to be a client. And pretty soon after that, they called up and said, you know, Nickelodeon uh, is, there, at the time, we're talking about in the 80s, right, when most of you weren't born. And uh, they said, you know, there are only 30 cable channels and Nickelodeon is number 30. It is the lowest rated cable channel in America. Uh, we really need your help. So Alan and I look at each other and we, we said, well, you know, here's the problem. We don't really like kids TV. And we don't really like most of the people who work at Nickelodeon. They're really boring. Um, and, you know, truth be told, we probably don't even really like kids. <laughs> and, and they said, well, you know, well, maybe we can work something out. And then they, I said, well, how much does it pay? And they told us. And we looked at our checkbooks and said, okay, we'll do it. Like, we're, you know, we're in. <laughs> so um, we, we went into Nickelodeon, and the people who ran it, a lot of people had been fired because it was failing. Um, and they had one show that got a rating, which is a show called from Canada called You Can't Do That on Television. It's where the whole Woo. idea of slime originated um, in that show. It, like, randomly... What was the phrase? I don't know. They would say, I don't know, and slime would fall down on their head, and that's how that whole thing sort of started. And they said, you know, we think that the rest of our shows should be like this too, because the thing that we keep finding out is we keep telling kids that we're fun, but we're really not, except for this show. And that's the reason that show got the rating and everything else got zeros. So um, one thing led to another. We took the gig. We started helping them out. And in fact, one of the things they liked about, they, the Nickelodeon people were all really weirded out that these rock and roll people were working on their precious kids channel because they were all there because they wanted to do good things for kids. They wanted like a good environment. They felt that commercial television was basically doing half hour serial commercials and calling them cartoons and they thought that things could be better. Um, but the thing they really liked that we did at MTV were those little animated M's and said, maybe you can do that, something like that for us. So we agreed and we decided we would redesign their logo. And we came in with an orange blob designed by two designers in Boston, a guy called Tom Corey and his partner, Scott Nash. And they said, well, you know, this is only one color, it's orange. And we said, yeah. And they said, well, you know, at MTV you have all these different colors. How come we don't have like lots of different colors? And the designer said, well, you know, the thing about this orange is it's a, it's a color that isn't found naturally in nature, like orange. And then Crunchyroll stuff. Right. <laughs> and uh, you just splat it on top of anything and it can be any shape you want. It, every time it can be a different shape, we don't really care as long as it's like a fun shape and kids like fun. It took us a long time to convince them to do that, but basically what we did is we started hiring animators from all around the world. And the other sort of piece of the puzzle was the music. You know, obviously at MTV we used, you know, rock bands to do all the, the music for uh, our animated logos. But at Nickelodeon, uh, I had been obsessed with radio jingles, the kind that I grew up with in Top 40. We knew we couldn't afford those. And we had been working with a bunch of older doo-wop singers in New York, uh, a group called the Jive Five, who had a band and you know went out on the oldie circuit and all that stuff. We couldn't afford their band, but we could afford them. And we went into Nickelodeon and said, look, we think that the sound of Nickelodeon ought to be um, uh, acapella doo-wop. And they looked at us and they said, well, what about Rafi? Maybe we could use Rafi, he's really popular. So I suggested that really they just need to pay me enough to buy a gun so I could shoot myself before <laughs> I, I would work with Rafi. And uh, I said, look, here's why you really wanna do these doo-wop singers. You guys are all really nice, modern, progressive, liberal people. And you know, what we really need to do for the youth of America is introduce them to black music. You know, black music is the sound of America. It's the greatest music in the history of America. Everything has come 
from you know black R&B and jazz singers. That's why you need to do this. And they looked at me and said, you know, you're right, that's a great idea. And we made the sound of Nickelodeon uh, acapella do up. And so that's how I got into animation. And so if I have my chronology correct, Hanna Barbera was next. Yeah. Can you um, explain how that came to pass? Yeah, one day Nickelodeon called up and asked me to breakfast. And they said, you know, the most popular show on Nickelodeon is Danger Mouse from the UK. I said, I know, it's like, what a great show it is. You're so lucky that you have this show. And they said, but here's the problem. You guys have made Nickelodeon so popular. Basically, like I said, when we went in, they were the worst rated network in America. And six months later, with no programming changes, they were the number one rated network in America. And Nickelodeon really started to grow like a house on fire. So um, they said, the problem is Nickelodeon's getting so popular that they keep raising the price of Danger Mouse like every contract period. And they've raised it so much that we think that maybe we could make our own cartoons. And that way, you know, we're not always like stuck for, you know, a negotiation, finding a new hit and all that. I said, great, what a great idea. And they said, so what, what should we do? Uh, I said, why, why are you asking me? And they said, well, you know, you do all that animation for us. So we wiggle your logo for 10 seconds. And we don't even do it. We find animators from around the world to do it. They say, yeah, but you're the only person we know who can do animation. So I had read a book um, on the history of cartoons uh, written by a movie critic named Leonard Malton and his partner Jerry Beck, who is one of the main animation historians in the world. And that was all that I knew about cartoons. And so I started spouting off to them stuff that I remembered from reading this book. And I basically said, well, what you should do is do cartoons the way they did them in the 30s and 40s, which is you should make one, you should put it on television, and if people like it, just make another one. That's what they did back in the day. That's how Tom and Jerry came to be. That's how Bugs Bunny came to be. And they said, gee, what a great idea. We'll make pilots. And I said, no, please don't make pilots. Because all pilots mean is that you're going to make something, they're going to give it to you, and then you're gonna to wanna to change everything. That's really, what a pilot is, is something that an executive changes. They say they like it, and then they wanna change everything. So they said, no, no, that's great, we'll do pilots. And I was really angry. You know, I, I'm probably like any of you, like if I have an idea and people don't accept it, I get really upset. And so we left the breakfast and they were really happy and I was really angry. And so over the next couple of years, they made some great pilots. That's where Ren and Stimpy came from, where Rugrats came from, where Doug came from. And all the while, I'm just seething. And when my next negotiation period came up, I was seething so much that I just decided to quit. Um, we were really, we were doing fantastically with them. They were doing fantastically, but I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I hated the fact that they didn't like my idea. So I started walking around to all my friends telling them that I was gonna quit. And one of those friends happened to be the head of Ted Turner's company. And they happened to have just bought the Hanna-Barbera animation studio. So he calls me up and said, hey, why don't you come and run the studio? And I said, I've never made a cartoon. He said, you know, it couldn't get any worse. They haven't had a hit since the Smurfs in 1981. So, you know, they just need a new injection and, you know, you've done all this great stuff for Nickelodeon. I said, I make the logos wiggle, right? You know, I, I don't really understand cartoons other than I watched them when I was a kid. And he said, really, you know, come on. So I look at my watch and literally on my watch are four Hanna-Barbera characters. Fred Flintstone's at 12, Scooby-Doo's at three, Huckleberry Hound is at six, and, and uh, Yogi Bear is at nine. It was 10.35 in the morning. I said, it'll take me three months to close my company because I had to walk next door to Alan and go, I'm quitting, you know, I'm like going to the West Coast. And 90 days later, uh, um, I walk into Hanna-Barbera for the very first time, having driven by it for 10 years, wondering what was in the building. And the first time I walk in the building, I'm the president of the company. It was like wild. So did you put your idea into practice? Yes, but it took me two years because every time I would pitch Ted Turner uh, this idea, my, my concept of the idea is that if an animator made a short film for us and we didn't like it, we would give it back to them. 
And Ted came from the school of, I paid for it, I own it for life. And I said, look, if, if that's what you want to do, that's fine, but I'm not your right guy. That doesn't happen in live action television. You know, if somebody doesn't, you know, like the idea, you know, they move on. And so it took a couple of years to convince Ted. We eventually did it. We made 48 short films. It's where uh, Dexter's Laboratory came from, Powerpuff Girls, Johnny Bravo, Cow and Chicken, Courage the Cowardly Dog, I Am Weasel. Um, and it's where Seth MacFarlane made his first commercial cartoon right out of school, uh, a short called Larry and Steve, which I was too stupid to realize was as good as it was. Um, so you have an amazing track record of working with some really incredibly talented people. And every time we sit down, I'm always asking you, what is it about these people? What is it about the, these cartoons that you see? How can you tell that someone is special? How do you know it? And so I'm curious, you know, you mentioned some names. I saw a lot of heads nodding. What, what is it about this content? Is it about these talented people that you can sense? What's different? Well, you know, the generic answer, and I was just on the Last Man panel, and I was saying that, you know, whether it's an animated show or a live action show, generically, you're looking for great characters and great stories. And so that's true whether it is the Fairly Odd Parents, I think Butch is up, up on stage right after us, or it's Adventure Time, or it's Being Puppy Cat. Great characters, great stories, like, you know, that always wins. But um, we do something that, at least in the, the process by which we really come about things, is fairly unique. Um, I ask people to actually pitch the cartoon in person, right? They, they do a rough storyboard, they put the board up on a, you know, on a pin board, and they literally, sometimes with a pointer, really like go through the whole cartoon. Um, my colleague Eric Homan, who runs development at Frederator, has pointed out to me that virtually all of our successful cartoons, the lead character is in fact the creator, um, even though about half the time they don't know it. But for any of you who have seen the original short film on Adventure Time, you might recall that in fact, in that short cartoon, the little boy is called Penn, not Finn. So Penn was one of the people who really realized he was that character. So from my standpoint, I'm looking for two things. One is, at the end of the cartoon pitch, I'm wondering if there's a character that I'm in love with. I'm actually fairly bad at story. I'm fairly bad at scripts. I'm really, I, I don't really understand how to read a piece of paper and really know, you know what's good. So I'm looking for that character that I can fall in love with, or the way Eric puts it, you know, somebody we want to hang out with, you know, a character you want to hang out with. But the other thing is I'm looking for that human, that creator, and what they feel like when they're pitching that cartoon, and whether I feel like they are so passionately involved with it that they can't do anything but make a great cartoon. You know, it's really about the person, uh, at least for me personally, I'm making a judgment about that as much as anything. Um, to just give you a preview on Butch, uh, Butch was working in the model, what we called the model department at Hanna-Barbera when I got there designing characters. And when we decided to do this shorts program, he was the first guy in my door going, I, got, we, we, I have an idea, my friends and I, we have an idea. And his, infectious, his infectious nature was such that I you know, agreed to a pitch right away. He pitched us a cartoon and we said yes. The cartoon comes out, it's not very good. But he, by the time it comes out and it's not very good, he's already pitched me another cartoon. And it's also a fantastic pitch. Butch is a, an animated character himself. You can really feel that he's in love with everything, that he really likes his own work a lot. <laughs> I mean that in a completely positive way. So um, the next cartoon comes out, and it's a little better, but it's still not very good. And I say to Butch, what, you know, you're so great in the pitch, like everything is perfect. Every joke hits, you know, that your voices are right. He goes, you know, you're really right. I'm, I actually don't know how to time a cartoon. I let other people do it and they really like screw it up on me. And I said, okay, well, what are you gonna do? He goes, I'm gonna teach myself how to time. 
And so the third and fourth cartoon he does are better and better. And I will tell you, having been through this a lot of times now, usually when someone makes a cartoon, all the rest of their cartoons are pretty much the same as the first one, or they get worse. It's really, really rare that somebody gets better. And every time out of the box, Butch Hartman got better. So this character, this physical character that's in front of me is performing as if he is one of the cartoon characters. And every time out, he has taught himself how to improve from the last time, which is really rare. So we're out there picking people as much as anything. Um, I, I tell this story a lot, not for anything other than how important the people are. Uh, I don't really know anything, like I said, about story and about scripts. I don't really know anything about cartoons. I don't watch cartoons all that much. I watched them when I was a kid, but then the Beatles came to America and like wiped them you know, out of my mind. Um, but I really spend a lot of time with people and with talented people. And it was about, now about 12, 13 years ago where we first met Penn Ward. He pitched the original Adventure Time. And it was the most unusual pitch in the world because here was a guy where it was 90 degrees out and he was wearing a thick woolen sweater um, I found out later when I, because I couldn't figure out like why he was doing it. He had just taught himself how to knit and he was so proud of the sweater that he made that like he wanted to wear it all the time. And he was starting the pitch with a guitar. And you know, the, 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 you know, it's a cartoon, like there's no guitar in the cartoon. And he starts the pitch by singing to us. And he sings what is now the theme to Adventure Time. He did it on a guitar rather than a ukulele. And you could tell there was something about this guy that you, you know, that you wanted to know and you wanted to know more about who he was. Well, right around the same time, an ex-intern at Frederator's office in New York, where I'm based, had come in, had helped us create our first online channel, Channel Frederator, and had rented a desk from me. Uh, and every once in a while, he was an engineer, he was a computer engineer, private internet engineer, and he would call me over at his desk. Are you going to tell them what he? Yeah, I'll get there. OK. <laughs> um, and he said, here, I, I really want you to see this thing I'm building. Have you ever heard of a tumble log? And I said, I've never heard of a tumble log, David. And he starts explaining it to me. And I nod. And I'm like trying to be really polite. And then I walk back to my desk having no idea what he's talking about. So a few months later, he, he shows me sort of the next iteration. So what do you think? And I, I said, uh, if you say it's good, David, I really believe you. I have no, you know, I, I, I'm 66 years old. I, I don't really know anything about the internet, you know, other than I like send email. So finally, I go over to his desk one day and he goes, you know, here's the latest thing. And I see up in the, the corner a logo. He said, yeah, I'm going to start a company just doing this tumble logging thing. I'm going to call it Tumblr. I told you and, it's like Willy Wonka. And... And I was like, okay, great. You know, he goes, but um, I have to raise some money. And I said, well, look, we'll put some money in. And we became the first investor. I will tell you, I had no idea what Tumblr was, but I knew that David was special and is special. I didn't really understand Adventure Time either. I'm the one person in the office that turned it down. If it wasn't for these guys, Eric Homan and Kevin Coldy in my office, I would have said no to Tumblr too. But when they introduced me to Penn, I knew that Penn was special. So ultimately, whatever it is that we do, we're looking at the people that we're in business with. You know, when I was just up here for the Last Man panel, it's the first time I met Jeremy. And, you know, the first thing I did when we got off stage is, hey, you know, if you're ever in New York, come by and visit us. He's special. And ultimately, that's what's happening when you're making a cartoon you're working with a person. I've now work, work, ugh, worked with Butch Hartman for 25 years. This is the 25th year that I know him. And the fact that he's constantly coming in with new ideas, we're working on another cartoon with him now. We started working on a movie together a couple of years ago. When this works, you're like married. You know, you're in business with people forever and you wanna just keep being in business with them and, and that's what, personally, I'm looking for. Other people are smarter than me. Carrie Miller, my 
colleague is out here in the audience, she actually does know how to read a script. Um, she knew when Bee and Puppycat came in and uh, one of our other colleagues wasn't so sure that it was for us, she took one look at it, read through the original storyboard and called up on the phone and screamed that we had to do it. Our colleague had already turned it down. Natasha Allegri, who is the creator, lives in Los Angeles but doesn't drive. And in those days before Uber, would walk back and forth from the office to work. And her apartment was four miles from our office. Carrie gets the storyboard, calls up our colleague, yells at him saying we have to do it. He's humiliated because he's already turned it down. He calls her and leaves a message on her machine, and by the time she had walked home, we had picked up being puppy cat, because there are people in my place who do understand things that I don't understand. So just, I just have to tell you a quick story about being puppy cat and how it came to be a part of uh, the Cartoon Hangover Select channel on Verve. There's a designer at Crunchyroll, this great guy named Mason, who. Uh, has designed actually a lot of the sort of crunchy roll logos and different things that you've sort of seen around. Um, and he would tell me, you must check out this series being puppy cat. Uh, you have to look at it. It deserves to be more. It deserves to be bigger. It's an incredible story. And he would just sort of poke at me and poke at me. And I, and I found Fred and we had a conversation and ultimately one thing came to another and we were able to do some more of it on Verve Select. But I think, um, you know, it's an incredible property and you were sort of talking about Interesting people and people who sort of they are the character. Um, you know, I, I just is Mason I, at the show. He's not here right now, unfortunately. I had lunch with him this week, though. You got to introduce me to him next time I'm in the office, so I can say thank you. I, I will. So, um, I, any questions from the audience? I have one. I have another one. Okay. Um, let me. If, if you do, just sort of fire your hand up, but I'm going to do one more question here. So, you've had a lot of success in different mediums, um, and you know. Obviously, being Puppy Cat, Bravest, first on YouTube. Um, can you talk a little bit about how sort of how distribution has or has not affected the kind of content and creators you work with? Yeah, it's changed everything. So you know, look, um, when I grew up, the average home in America had two channels of television, and that didn't change until the late '80s, uh, when I think in 1987 the average home had 35 channels. And what happened going from two channels to 35 channels is you went from the Flintstones to, Be to Beavis and Butthead. What changed when there's a lot of channels, they got to decide who they're for. And once you know who you're for, you can do something specifically for that audience. And you know, back in the day when there were only a few channels, they really had to do something for everybody. I was nine when the Flintstones came out. There was one television set in my house. It was in my parents' bedroom. And when something like the Flintstones came on, we all sat down, and my parents had to like it, and the nine-year-old had to like it, and my five-year-old sister had to like it. That's what having only one channel or two channels or three channels is like. Now there's 35 channels. This one's for sports fans, this one's for news junkies, this one's for old people, this one's for young people, this one's for kids. And MTV comes along and decides they want to do something more than rock and roll videos, and they come up with Beavis and Butthead, and it was the only place in the world that would do something like, you know, would do something like Beavis and Butthead. But now, you know, the Nickelodeons of the world, the Cartoon Networks of the world, the MTVs, the Comedy Centrals, they're all really big businesses that reach millions and millions of people every year. And they have to support really high salaries for really rich executives. And by the way, for really rich stars, you know, whether it's Jon Stewart or, John, or Stephen Colbert or whatever it is, they, you know, they want to get compensated for what they do. And all of a sudden, the risk for all these places go up. And now we come in with Adventure Time. This is only 10 years ago. We come in with Adventure Time. And Nickelodeon, who had absolute rights on it for a couple of years, they look at it and go, well, it doesn't really look like the other cartoons we do. And it looks like it should be for really little kids, like you know five-year-olds. I said, did you listen to it? You know, Did you hear what these characters are doing and saying? They said, yeah, we, we don't understand that either. That sounds like it's for older kids. 
And you know, we're really for six to 11 year olds. And all of a sudden, these big companies can't afford to take these creative risks. Now YouTube comes along. Actually, in our case, iTunes comes along, right? That's where we started. And now what we know is that we can do something for a very specific group of people. Being Puppycat, I think, is a really perfect example. Here's the conventional wisdom in the movie business, in the television business, and in the kid business, which is girls will watch things for boys, but boys won't watch things for girls. And that's true whether it's a grown-up girl or a young girl, or a grown-up boy or a young boy. That is the conventional wisdom. We pitched a show with Butch Hartman, uh, a, a movie over at Sony Pictures where we had a deal called Planet Penny. And I, I won't um, get into the backstory of it, but suffice it to say, the studio loved it, and they said, but you know, Penny can't be a star. We can't, she can't be the star of the picture. How about if we change it to Planet Pete? And we did, and you've never heard of the movie because it never got made because it was Planet Penny, and that was what made the story great, right? So the conventional wisdom also says that, how many women are in the audience today? Woo! The conventional wisdom says that you don't like cartoons, right? This is what every television executive and every movie executive will tell you, that you guys don't like cartoons. And so if we did something like being Puppycat and we brought it into a network and it didn't matter what the network was called, it didn't matter who it was for, they would go, well, nobody's going to watch this. You know, the, this is for girls and, you know, you can't have a girl star because boys won't watch it. So we made it on our own on YouTube. It went ballistic. You know, I, some of you might be Kickstarter backers. We raised, you know, almost $900,000 to do those first episodes that are on Cartoon Hangover Select on Verve. And the truth is, without a place like Verve, without a place like YouTube, um, there is no way that one of these larger television networks can find and zero in on the audience that's right for being Puppycat, which, by the way, just so we're clear, it isn't primarily women. Our audience for being Puppycat is 50-50, men and women, because, you know, the truth is, is men will watch something where there's a girl star, especially when it's good, duh, right? And what we're all looking for every time we turn out, every time we, like, load up our Verve app, every time we go to YouTube, every time we go to traditional television or Netflix or Amazon or wherever it is, you know what we're looking for? We're looking for something we haven't seen before that makes us happy. We're looking for something where there's a character in there that we just can't get enough of and we want to see more and more and more of. And that's true whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. And the truth is, in the world that we're in, a really fresh woman character like B is something that men are going to like just as much as women. And the fact that she's goofy and funny and not overtly sexy is really like part of what makes her really special. So, so here's my question. We're, we're here at Crunchyroll Expo. There's a lot of amazing stories that come out of Japan. Um, but, and we just screened Last Man. But yep. I feel like the Western world, there's sort of a dearth of this complex, unique, different animated storytelling. Yep. So what do we have to do collectively to get more of these stories made when clearly the audience wants them, but the infrastructure says, no, you know, this yep. isn't what they want? So, you know, everyone that's here, you know, the 10,000, 12,000 people that are here at CRX. We think are, it's gonna be 15. Okay, 15,000 we'll people we'll that see. are coming. Um, they're the solution. And here's why I say that, you know, so, um, in my day, cons didn't exist. The way that I got together with my friends was at rock concerts. And these cons are sort of, you know, the, your generation's equivalent of rock concerts. And I would sit in the audience and I would go, you know, I, I love this music, I love this stuff. I can't believe that there's only one place a week on television where I can watch this. You know, it was like maybe a variety show on Sunday night would have like a juggler and a magician, and in between they would have the Beatles, right? I mean, that's really how it worked. 
And all of a sudden, I get to be 28 years old, my first job in television, and what is it? It's to like be part of the management of running a channel where all we're gonna do is run rock and roll records. Well, there are people in this audience that are gonna be attacking you all weekend, Arlen, for a job, because they know that this kind of animation is, the day has come. And little by little, they grew up in a different world than I grew up in. They, when, when they got to be 12, there was animation for them. When they got to be 18, there was animation for them. For those of you who are older than 18, there's animation for you too. And they know that the audience is ready for this. It's just the executives that don't know. And little by little, one person after another here is gonna be in a position to make a difference just like you are, right? And they're gonna be convincing you of the next thing that you don't understand because they get it, because this is their world. So the, the, all, the only thing we can all do is one, I know you already are telling every friend of yours that doesn't like the stuff that you like that they're missing something. And we just gotta do that more. Those of you who write blogs, you gotta like write more about the stuff that you like. Those of you who are like trying to get into this business, don't take a stupid job at a stupid place. Take a job at a place like Verve or like our company, Frederator, and persuade us. So um, get, ready, get ready to throw your tomatoes. I personally could give a crap about anime. I don't watch it. It's not my thing, right? It's a bold but, statement to make it crunch I know that. Fred. <laughs> I said get the tomatoes. I'm ready to like to be pelted. But you know, here's the thing. A guy in my office, Kevin Coldy, used to run John Chris Salusi's studio, the Ren and Stimpy studio. I convinced him 12 years to come over to Frederator to help us run our studio with Eric Homan. And he said, well, you know, that's okay, but you know, I'm really into video games. I'm a video game guy. I said, okay, whatever. He goes, so on my own, I went and got rights to a couple video games to make them into animated shows and movies. I got Ape Escape from Sony, and I got Castlevania from Konami. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about because I actually like video games even less than I like anime. <laughs> Tomatoes, please, I'm ready. Um, and I said, okay, he goes, so I really wanna make these, and um, if, I, if I get a chance to make them, I'll, I'll have to leave. I said, well, you know, Kevin, you know, I've, I've known Kevin for many years, you know, probably 25 years. I said, well, how about, why don't you just make them at Frederator? He said, well, you don't make that kind of stuff. You know, you make these comedy cartoons for kids and all that. I said, we make cartoons, we make animated shows with people we believe in, and I wouldn't be asking you to come to work here unless I believed in you. So we'll support you in doing this. We did the first script on Castlevania 12 years ago. It took us 10 years to find a partner, in, in this case, in Netflix, that was willing to come along with us. You know, from our perspective, it's all about like falling in love with creative people and doing everything that we can. I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to draw. I can't write a script. I can't read a script. I can't make a budget. Frankly, I can't follow a schedule, as Carrie can you know, attest. I can't do anything that I'm supposed to do except for fall in love with great creative people. And once you're in love with great creative people, you, at least what I do for a living, is I try and figure out a way to help them. And every person here who knows a creative person who has a great idea, even if you don't know how to do anything, if you can help them do what they do, they might change the world. And what all of us are looking to do, what you guys are looking to do on Verve, is you are in the process of changing the world. It's the reason we wanted to be partners with you. So that in fact, a thing, a show like Being Puppy Cat could have a home and we could have a chance to make it. It's a really expensive show. It's really difficult to make money back on YouTube. We were able to get it there and really build, you know, introduce it to a lot of you folk, which is, you know, fantastic. You guys came along and started doing your part of the job of building a platform where things like this could live. That's what every one of us could do, is just be the fans that we are, and if we're lucky enough to get a job where we can convince somebody else to do the thing that we love, that's what we all should do. That's what I've been doing. So speaking of great creative people, are we getting more Bravest Warriors this year? We will be getting more Bravest Warriors soon. 
soon. Do we know how soon? We will be doing 13 new half hours this year alone. I think it starts October, November. December. December? December. I told you I don't know anything. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm actually an animation student. Fantastic, so where? Uh, at SVCTE. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the best advice that you could give for a young animator? Draw more. <laughs> you draw all the time? Yeah. Draw more. <laughs> um, do you mean from the perspective of coming up with your own cartoons? Uh, or just how do you can animate on other people's cartoons? Uh, either, really. Well, there's, diff there's different advice. For drawing on other people's cartoons, just draw more. <laughs> because that's what they're looking for, is somebody who can't stop. And somebody who really knows their craft. You know, like my biggest surprise when I uh, first got into animation uh, was when an older animator told me that the problem with a lot of animators is that they didn't know anatomy. I said, well, what difference does it make? It's a cartoon character. And he explained to me that whether you're a cartoon character or a human being, you got to have anatomy. you got to know where the bones go and how the elbows work and et cetera, et cetera. And the only way you can do that is to do more. When it comes to your own cartoons, here's the piece of advice I give to artists that they never follow, which is take more English classes read more and write more. Because the, the biggest thing that we've seen, even with people who have fantastic ideas and fantastic characters, is they've spent their entire life, like since they're three, drawing every minute that they can. And then all of a sudden, when they're 20, they have an idea for a show, and they think they know how to write it. But the truth is, is if you haven't been reading, you haven't been writing, stories, and I don't mean necessarily typing stories, you can write them on your storyboards or whatever it is you do, that you have to practice your writing just as much as you are practicing your drawing. And where most of the new ideas from artists that we have fall down is when they really just haven't worked on their writing enough. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. We, okay, we have time for one more. You wanna fire it? I was just wondering if the decrease in uh, risk taking that translated to platforms like Verve taking over, being able to try new ideas has resulted in a decrease in risk for artists as well. Like if there's a decrease in overhead, so the survivability of artists has increased. Well, um, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, yes, if you're working for one of the big media companies, there's always like less risk there. And there's always more risk at a new place. I mean, we've been working on YouTube now since the beginning, so that's 12 years. There's less risk at YouTube now than there was. They have built into the algorithm a way for us to experiment less. They have made sure that we keep doing the thing that works rather than trying new ideas. But a Verve, an Instagram, a Snapchat, a platform that none of us have ever heard of yet because it hasn't been invented yet. Every one of those things is there for new ideas and new people. Uh, to go back to David Karp quickly, while he trained himself as an engineer, he was the son of a music composer, primarily a classical music composer. And he admired creative people to no end. And every time he would come up with a new feature on Tumblr, he'd come over to me and he'd show me the feature. He goes, what do you think a photographer would think of this? Or what do you think a writer would think of this? He was building his platform as a home for creative people. And the truth is, is that everyone who builds new great ideas is a creative person themselves. And in some way or the other, they're building something for other creative people to use. So the only place that um, risk goes away is in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, if you don't feel like you can take a risk, then that's the problem, not you know, whoever it is is gonna hire you. Because what we have found is that wonderful creative people, even if they're working, there, there was a guy who worked for us called Eric Beck who started a YouTube channel called Indie Mogul. And when he pitched us Indie Mogul, he sent us a video 
and he begged us to hire him. He said, I'm working in the most dead-end job in an insurance office that I can. I made this pilot in my backyard. That's the reason it's called Backyard FX. I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep doing this. Please get me out of my soul-sucking job. Right? That's what a creative person does. A creative person takes risks every day, whether it's at work or on their own. And then platforms like Verve, platforms like YouTube, platforms like we've mentioned, those are the places to try out your new ideas because the chances are that you're going to do it over at Fox are pretty low. Right? I say that nicely because I want to make a show for them, but that's another story entirely. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I could listen to Fred for hours. I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank we you promised all for you more Bravest by December. Uh, Last Man premieres today. And check out Harmon Quest, September 15th. Thank you so much for being here. Thank awesome. you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Stay for Butch Hartman. <laughs>